Orena, and welcome uh, to everyone to this, uh, for us in Aotearoa, New Zealand, early morning impact springboard session. Enga mana, enga reo, enga rau rangatira mā, ki te mana whenua, tēnā koto. Ko tā uh, Edmund Hillary, te tangata, ko Edmund Hillary Fellowship, e whare, ko Rosalie Nelson, tōku ingua. Uh, this is a really important keynote discussion. The global lessons for transforming New Zealand into a low carbon economy by 2050. My name is Rosalie Nelson. For those of you that don't know me, I have the privilege of leading the Hillary Institute and the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. For those of you that may not be familiar with us, the Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a community of over 500 uh, change makers, innovators, entrepreneurs, and investors, uh, with over 400 of those being international. Um, but they all have a shared commitment to Aotearoa New Zealand as a base camp for global impact. And we are a part of the Hillary Institute, which has uh, 11 extraordinary global leaders in climate change and climate action. And you're going to be hearing from one of those very special laureates, Amy Christensen, today. Um, I'd like to just open with the karakia, just to really center us um, and ready us for this important conversation. Ho o te whikaro, ho o te tangata, ho o te aroha, te po e here nei i a tātou, Māori ora ki a tātou, homi e, hui e, ai ki e. With today's session, our goal is really to encourage fresh thinking and to frame discussions about how Aotearoa New Zealand can responsibly manage this critical transition to meeting its 2050 net zero commitments and how we can do so in ways that affirm economic and social as well as environmental benefits. The format today is that um, we will be introducing Anna Komenik, who will be hosting the session, Amy will get to present her initial thinking, and then we will open up the floor for questions. So there are a few notes through this. Please do keep your audio off or unmuted unless you are speaking. Um, however, we do want to see your faces, so please do keep your video on um, if, if this is possible, because this is really about community and it helps us to be able to see each other. Um, the Zoom name, please have the Zoom name as your own personal name. It's not work or another person. Uh, and just to be clear that we are recording the session to make it available afterwards. So if you have thoughts or questions, please use the chat box and we will pick up on these um, either during or at the end of uh, Amy's portion of presentation. Now, what we have found is that quite often people want to make comments or they want to respond to each other and we do encourage that. However, if you do have a question, please just mark that very que uh, clearly with a uh, question in capitals at the beginning of it. That just helps us to be able to sift um, through the chat that comes through. The host for our session is Anna Kominick. Now, Anna is the chair of the Hillary Institute and the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, and was appointed as the chair of the Electricity Authority, Te Manahiko, in July last year. Now, prior to that role, she was the independent chair of the Electricity Retailers Association of New Zealand. Anna has worked for a wide variety of private and public sector organizations during the course of her career. And this includes as a former Asia Pacific director of WISC, a Boeing backed company, which is both developing a, a world first all electric self flying air taxi. She is currently a director of Dawn Aerospace and she advises in the New Zealand aviation and aerospace sector. And look, I'm, I just feel hugely privileged on a personal level to get to work with Anna as the board chair. So Anna, thank you so much for moderating this session. I'll hand over to you. Kia ora, Rosalie and tēnā koutou katoa. I have enormous pleasure um, in introducing Amy Christensen, um, international climate leader, strategist, innovator, Hilary Laureate and 
a woman um, who I have had the pleasure to get to know uh, in my role and who has enormous grace and courage. Uh, she's been a leader in developing and implementing solutions for decarbonisation and electrification with governments, business and community around the globe. Um, she has three decades of experience in environmental law, policy and investment. Her achievements include brokering the first ever bilateral agreement on climate change between the US and another nation, uh, Costa Rica in 1994. She uh, helped build the sustainability platforms for among others, the United Nations, Microsoft, Google and Virgin, where she helped Rick, Sir Richard Branson develop the Carbon War Room. Amy thinks big, uh, she backs that up with action and both lo globally and locally. And this, uh, in my view, sets her apart from many. She is the founder of the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience and served as its executive director for five years and is now an emeritus board member and proud founder. At the Institute, Amy took the big ideas that she is renowned for around climate solutions and implemented the systems thinking it requires on a local scale to improve the regional agricultural sector, as well as provide a huge boost to uh, local clean energy ecosystems. She was also at COP28, and I know has many insights from the negotiations and her work there on catalytic climate to finance and place-based resilience strategies. Amy, thank you for being here. I know you have a cold. I know it is a different time zone and I'm just so grateful for your time. You are a very, very generous human and we love you very dearly. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much, Anna. It's such an honor to be here. And I apologize in advance. I am quite under the weather with a bit of a fever and a cold, but this is so important and really uh, such a passion for me to collaborate with the Hillary Institute and the Edmund Hillary Fellows. It's been such a, since 2010 when I was awarded the Hillary Laureate, um, such an, a wonderful journey uh, to collaborate with this community and also a place, New Zealand. And so I'm really looking forward to this conversation and approach it from sharing uh, what's happening elsewhere for a bit of food for thought for in New Zealand. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we'll have. Anna and I have a few, I think, question and answers and then opening up to everyone in the room. So thank you so much. And thanks for the note in the chat as well. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and share a few slides background, um, which I hope, as I said, will be a bit of inspiration as we think about uh, a net zero New Zealand. Um, so starting, I always like to start with where are we? And the Global Climate Action Tracker is a fantastic resource that looks at where we are vis-a-vis -vis country action on climate. Um, and as we can see, um, we have far too many countries whose commitments and policy making to date um, are critically insufficient, highly insufficient, insufficient, and almost sufficient. No one yet is Paris Agreement compatible with their policy, although Costa Rica and a couple of other countries are almost sufficient with their policy making to date. Um, and New Zealand uh, as is highly insufficient, um, as with many industrialized countries at this point. Um, and if you look at on the right side of the screen, as we think about our fair share, um, so again, um, insufficient um, given the historical contributions that New Zealand has made. So those of us in the United States and New Zealand who are in the state of not yet being quite on track to where we need to be, whether it's to meet the Paris goals or to meet really based on that fair share contribution over the years, um, it's urgent for all of us to get our policies aligned and to shift the close to $7 trillion in, policy, in subsidies each year that go to fossil fuels away from that to the transition across energy and across agriculture and food systems to get us all on track. All right, so, oops, let's see, there we go. So what does this mean for us? Um, I always, I do like to turn each year to the Global Risks Report for the World Economic Forum, most recently came out in January, Zurich Insurance and others are involved in producing this report each year. Um, and as you can see in this 19th edition in 2024, the um, 
biggest short-term risk they're saying is misinformation and disinformation, but in the longer term, climate-related threats dominate the top 10 risks that global populations will face. Um, and I would add that misinformation and disinformation are also exacerbating um, our inability to act on climate change. And so I see these two coming together very strongly. Um, and here this really dem oops, demonstrates um, the risks and how they shift. So the near term top 10 risks, extreme weather events in the green um, and pollution. And then in 10 years, five of the 10 top 10 risks um, are environment related um, due to biodiversity, extreme weather events, climate change um, and change to earth systems. Then, um, I think this quote is applicable. This was from the WEF report several years ago that just understanding that our economies, our fate as species are deeply connected with our natural environment as many of us on this call know well. Um, and that protecting and restoring natural systems is also crucial to, crucial to combating climate change. So thinking about net zero goals in the context of restoring our natural systems, both for the benefits they bring to our economies, but also nature is often the best investment when it comes to resilience um, and climate adaptation. When we're thinking about risk, I just wanted to point out a resource. Um, Riskthinking.ai is a company I've been working with for a couple of years now as an advisor. Um, and uh, Bloomberg has invested in the company and they're working to bring climate risk onto the Bloomberg terminals for public companies. So as we think about this, they have 3 billion hexagons across the world down to a very small geographic space and looks at both our transition risk and our physical risk. So physical risk, sea level rise, storm impacts, water availability, transition risk, um, is really about climate policy and carbon pricing. So if you're a steel company, um, are you gonna have access to the water you need? Are you gonna have a carbon price on the coal uh, that you're relying on or the other um, uh, high emitting activities in producing um, steel? Um, so governments are starting to act. The World Bank has a, has a good tracker of carbon pricing across different initiatives. Um, including uh, cap and trade to taxes, and this is at the national as well as subnational jurisdictions. So, a good reference for folks. So, what are we doing about it here in the United States where I am? Um, when President Biden came in, um, he um, put climate front and center on day one, um, and within the first week was, was rejoining the Paris Agreement and making a commitment that spread across climate goals, as you can see here. Um, his uh, commitments that were made um, include um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least half uh, below 2005 levels by 2030, reaching 100% carbon pollution-free electricity by 2035, uh, achieving a net zero emissions economy by 2050 in alignment with Paris, and then delivering 40% of the benefits from federal investments in climate and clean energy to disadvantaged communities. And that's um, going to come up later when I talk about California and their approach uh, as well. Um, here's an assessment that the World Resources Institute did tracking the Biden administration's progress on climate action. Um, so really recommend this, won't spend time reading through all of this, but from what has been achieved in the first three years of the administration and where there's been significant progress, some progress, and off track. Clearly, the United States has yet to tax pollution, has yet to put a price on carbon. So that's where we're off track. Um, has been some key progress in um, everything from clean electricity standards to appliance standards um, to tackling hard to abate sectors. Um, but perhaps you know the biggest em emphasis for the Biden administration has been through spending with the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. And that tool of federal allocation of dollars incentivizing action has delivered some um, significant some significant results. Um, beyond the United States at the federal level, I wanted to mention California because California, um, similar climate to New Zealand and um, 
is one that has a unique story. And ever since the Bush administration pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol has really been leading in the deployment of climate um, policies. Um, I'm starting with energy efficiency. This is a, um, a graph that is showing us what some have historically called the Rosenfeld effect. Um, Art Rosenfeld was a member of the California Energy Commission. And this is an example of how a policymaker can make incredible impact. Um, he advocated for investing in energy efficiency in California and 1972 um, uh, passed um, energy efficiency standards for appliances in California. And so as you can see, um, California's energy uh, use leveled off on a per capita basis while other US states continued to rise. And then that shows the difference. And the implication of this um, can be seen when it comes to um, the benefits potentially to greenhouse gas emission reductions. But it was a nice um, start to California's leadership 30 years uh, before taking action directly on climate. Um, this is a um, study of the levelized cost of energy um, globally, and it's by Lazard, um, an investment banking research firm, um, and shows the, how energy efficiency can be the smartest, the first investment. Um, I had a, a client I worked with, who I loved working with, the CEO of Duke Energy, one of the biggest polluters in the United States, and he just he called energy efficiency the fifth fuel, but actually it should be the first fuel. Um, so just, I think it's often forgotten as a fuel and especially in the built environment, depending country by country, but definitely an opportunity in the built environment and in appliances to make dramatic improvements just by setting better standards. So as new appliances are constructed um, and new buildings are constructed, um, that can be tackled. Um, this is a calendar of California's action on climate change. Uh, starting in 2002 with the first renewable portfolio standard, 20% by 2010, and the Pavley Act, um, which was the really the first climate bill, required CARB, the California Resources Board, to set standards for greenhouse gas emissions for new vehicles. Um, and then that was broadened and built upon over the last 22 years. Um, and importantly, um, Oh, oh, this is a helpful, I think, a reorganization, not just by year, but by tactic. So uh, putting a price on carbon through cap and trade, um, funding um, transportation infrastructure for electric vehicles. Um, so a tool to make more expensive fossil fuels, um, emission standards tools, cheaper to adopt clean energy, um, net metering, which of course charges, if you have a, a home and you're putting solar on your home, net metering um, allows you to um, buy and sell from the grid, um, hopefully on a parity basis. So same cost. So if you're generating solar, you're buying electricity at the same price, um, providing that incentive. Um, banning fossil fuels um, and increases in efficiency have continued, especially with a focus on um, low-income communities uh, because California's um, regulatory approaches have been incredibly effective in um, decarbonization um, and increased energy efficiency, but the prices have not um, been um, have not followed suit as they should have given the investment energy efficiency, and a lot of that is about. Um, inefficiency of policy deployment. So as New Zealand is working on developing its global warming policies, learning from mistakes and strategies that optimize efficiency by thinking holistically about global warming policies and understanding how to put those in place in a way that doesn't lead to price increases and investing, especially in low-income communities. Um, this is the result from California's investments, as I mentioned, um, as far as it's been an impact um, from an impact on greenhouse gas reductions uh, per capita and per unit of GDP. California's economy has continued to grow, um, but decoupled from emissions. Um, so I mentioned equity. There are um, a handful of efforts that have been taken subsequent to the early climate legislation in California 
uh, to ensure that extra attention was taken to bringing these clean energy benefits to low income communities. So I wanted to mention those, um, the low income weatherization program that California focuses provides no cost rooftop solar and energy efficiency to low income households. Um, and then a focus on ensuring that the proceeds from the California cap and trade bill go to those low income communities, disadvantaged communities, um, uh, and those most vulnerable. And then the, the federal government, as I mentioned before, has um, the requirement of 40% of the overall benefits of the federal investments across the board um, benefit marginalized, underserved, overburdened by pollution communities, disadvantaged communities. Um, I, I, I mentioned the the planetary boundaries as a resource, because as we look, there's at action across key sectors um, to address the state of the planet. I find the planetary boundaries a really important reference point to understand that we're not just tackling climate change, we're tackling biosphere integrity. We're talking novel entities, which is plastic pollution, geochemical flows, which is related to food and agriculture, um, and of course, land system transition. And one of the Hillary laureates, Johan Rockström, is um, the one of the key authors of the planetary boundaries and such a resource on these issues. And what it told us is in addition to transforming energy in our electricity system, we have to transform our food system. And of course, for New Zealand, um, the food system is at least 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. And so it's a critical uh, focus for action. And our global system has to change as well. Um, and you know, food and agriculture is the source globally of a majority of methane emissions and um, somewhere around a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. And so the um, Eat Lancet uh, Commission on Food Systems and Climate and uh, Food Systems in the Planet, um, it uh, called for five different actions around transforming food and agriculture for nature and humans to thrive um, from diets to um, agricultural priorities of funding from high quantities of food to, to healthy quality food, um, intensifying food production for high quality output, coordinated governance of land and oceans, and having food losses and waste as food waste is a massive source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and farms have huge potential to be solutions for biodiversity and for greenhouse gas emissions, as we know from soil health. And, um, and uh, agroforestry, agroecology practices. So I talk about um, transforming a food system to be decentralized, decarbonized, and regenerative. And also I would add diversified. Decentralized can imply diversification, but I should really call that out. Um, so decentralized growing for place, localizing processing, localizing energy use for food systems, regenerative, people always ask, what is that? Um, there's a lot of banding about of the term regenerative, and there are three different standards under development and use now. Um, generally, uh, a definition I've turned to is that um, farming and grazing practices that um, uh, reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter and restoring degraded soil biodiversity, resulting in both carbon drawdown and improving the water cycle. And these are some of the specific activities and practices that farmers are integrating in shifting to regenerative agriculture principles, things like cover crops and no-till farming to leave the soil intact, um, and integrating animals into farm practices as well into the soil. Um, so, uh, decarbonized, uh, localizing our food system, obviously reduces greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, um, renewable electricity on site, solar thermal and geothermal for high heat use needs for pasteurization of uh, dairy, for instance, or for drying, if you're in the case of New Zealand doing milk powder, um, and then electrified transportation and of course, addressing methane. Um, and so on methane, um, there is methane capture um, and of reducing um, animal-based uh, consumption and rethinking proteins. And I would also add um, that some in the agriculture sector in New Zealand have been talking about replanting of pine forests, monoculture pine forests, and just wanted to note there's been some good analysis about 
pine forests are not a replacement for reducing greenhouse uh, methane emissions. So a methane emission is not the same as a sequestration of carbon. Um, so just thinking about how we're addressing these and an apple to apple strategy. Um, given that protein is so critical, um, working to make it regenerative, um, thinking about what we're sourcing from the ocean, turning to cultivated meats, precision fermentation, and more plant-based proteins. In transforming ocean foods, huge opportunity for providing food. Um, we're seeing in coastal communities that the big ocean trawlers, um, largely from China, um, are extracting um, massive amounts of um, fish and other sea life so that coastal communities no longer have access to their food source that they've had. Um, and more than 3 billion people rely on sea-based ocean foods. Also, we can create jobs by transforming ocean foods to be more responsible, such as farming seaweed, farming bivalves, other smarter solutions rather than the wild extraction um, that is so um, harmful today. And um, it can really provide abundance. Um, so when you're growing seaweed, you're also helping to deacidify the ocean and providing ecosystems. And so there are so many co-benefits that come from transforming ocean foods. Um, I'm an advisor at Aleph Farms, which is a cultivated steak company out of Israel, and they are making a uh, steak in a lab. And it's, um, you know, these the things about the cultivated meats is that they are slaughter free. Um, in the case of Aleph Farms, they're non GMO. They use plant based inputs. They can be grown anywhere, even in space. <laughs> They've been doing um, with the Israel Space Agency and NASA. Um, and um, they have a commitment to being net zero uh, for scopes one and two by 2025 and scope three by 2030. Um, and so thinking about that future protein, what does that look like? What's that mix? Regenerative protein um, and um, uh, fermented as well as cultivated. So the U.S., um, just tap back to what's happening there with government resources and government allocation of funds to drive that building of a resilient food future in the United States. The Inflation Reduction Act had $40 billion for food and agriculture. Um, and as you can see, um, there's uh, it, it, the focus is on how do we transform um, the the primary production, distribution and processing, retail and consumption, but clearly primary production has been the vast majority of the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that's where a lot of the focused uh, resources are provided. Um, just to be more specific about that farmer focused funding, um, there was um, $6 billion allocated for underserved farmers. The United States, um, African American farmers were historically dispossessed of their land and not provided access to the same capital as white farmers. That was $6 billion, really a, a reparation of sorts, although some people um, cringe at that term. Um, but I think we need to talk about um, inequity and historical inequity. And then conservation stewardship program, funding to support and incentivize farmers to do those regenerative and conservation-based practices, and a whole climate smart commodities program, grants going to groups of farmers and companies who are working to do regenerative potatoes to uh, regenerative oats across all the board, all, all the across the commodities um, in the U.S. Um, and then um, the, I just want to mention at a local basis, the Rockefeller Foundation has a fantastic resources of their food system vision prize. There were um, communities all around the world, 1300 around the world submitted their visions for their food system in their community. And it was up to a space of 100 square miles. And those are fantastic visions and versions of the future of food. Um, we did one here in Idaho, where I am. I'm in central Idaho. We're the third largest dairy state in the country. Um, number one for potatoes and peas and sugar beets and a few others. Um, but in our community, we were doing cattle, alfalfa, and barley. And it was taking all of our water and sending it out of our area. And our food exporting our water, including a lot of our hay and alfalfa, set to feed Chinese dairy cows. Not good for our community. So we founded a, an institute to focus on resilience and launched a revolving loan fund to fund our local farmers to change their farm practices at the local level. So this is something that communities can consider doing, accessing resources. Um, and, um, and so these are a few of our portfolio companies from a micro dairy to a cornmeal um, uh, milling operation to um, uh, 
farmer that wanted to switch from alfalfa to local market veggies to a meat processing facility and mushrooms. And um, the Institute's work um, is around building more resilient system, which meant localizing our energy system, localizing our food system. And that's their primary tool we've taken to localize our food system. And we've worked collaboratively with our county government officials on the energy strategy for its decarbonization. And just to give you a sense of what some local communities are doing, this is what our local community has done, setting the goals, um, putting in a requirement of 75% clean electricity by 2025 for the city's operations, county's operations, and then um, moving beyond that to um, residents and businesses. Um, and it just tracks what each policy will drive as far as greenhouse gas reductions. And so thinking about New Zealand's um, just digging in the food because food is such a significant source of emissions there and a priority there, um, assessing what are the risks to the food system. And I wanna note that the milk protein that's, sorry, the milk powder that's exported uh, largely to China, you know, it's a relatively unprocessed low value product commodity that's sold out of New Zealand from the dairy industry. And a lot of the companies who are buying milk powder have made greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And so when they're thinking about where they're getting their milk from and is it regenerative, low carbon, et cetera, a lot of that decision-making by the biggest food companies will trickle down to the source of the milk. So thinking about those risks, also weather-related risks, floods, others, and then what are the assets that New Zealand has for its food future and investing in innovation and definitely government leadership to shift money from the activities that don't serve climate action and resilience to activities that do. And I really do believe New Zealand could be this incredible global test bed for global food and farm solutions. Really uh, exciting potential there, but needs a collaboration among all the parties. All right, I will, I know I'm a little over, so I will just, um, I want to just mention that, um, you know, I, a little, so thinking about government action, aligning with private sector action, I wanted to just share, um, note that I was in government, so working on these policies for four years to get them aligned to, to um, I was working in Latin America to work with them to get the right policies in, frame, in place as they opened up their energy sector to private investment. Um, and then I went to the private sector and was at Google and it was really how can business solve, how can Google solve climate change? So we vote, so we lobbied for that California global warming bill in 2006. We, um, in our operations, we made a commitment to carbon neutrality in 2007. We sourced renewables for our data centers, which were being built all over the world fast with no consideration to the greenhouse gas emissions of those until we made the commitment to carbon neutrality and made a priority to source renewables for those data centers and then prioritize green buildings for efficiency and health of employees. And we also did this really cool project because we were google.org, the philanthropic arm of the company, we wanted to show the world the future of the electrification of transportation. And I know you know, New Zealand um, has a real opportunity to electrify everything, which is kind of the mantra of many of us these days, get off of natural gas, get off of um, transportation, liquid fossil fuels um, to electrify our systems. And we did a project showing the world the, the future of the electrification of transportation, made plug-in hybrid, showed them plugged into the solar panels and the future of that vehicle to grid more efficient in our face of our energy system, which I'm excited to see real progress on that since. Okay. Um, and finally, I'll just wrap up that um, my um, sometimes having worked on climate for 30 years, I get pretty sad about the state of the planet. And then I get really excited by my clients. Um, and I was, so I had them on the page. So the people I work with who are innovating, give me that hope. But often I just go to nature and spend a lot of time in nature. And so um, as we think about the steps that each of us are taking, um, I think it's recognized that we're operating in a capitalist structure that incentivizes short-term financial returns. And sometimes it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to be fighting and working for the planet in a construct that's about short-term financial returns. So um, I turn to um, nature for healing and inspiration and the community of people I get to work with every day, including this one, to provide that. And just to remember that um, it can be hard, especially for younger um, people I work with who are seeing their future and to be there as a resource and an ally and a colleague to help support um, in this work because, and that's, I think, um, 
such an important role of what the Hillary Fellowship can provide as well. All right, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. That um, is huge. Uh, just some wonderful content here to, to walk, work through. And we do have some questions. I am really interested in, uh, you, you have taken these big ideas and applied them at a local level. How do you manage the, the stakeholders in particular? And this is picking up a little bit on uh, one of the questions from uh, one of our fellows, David Bent. You know, how do you manage, for example, the incumbent uh, foods producers um, who tend to have a well can tend to have a perspective on how that future should play out how, how have you managed that and what are your observations um it's not smooth uh first of all so I won't say I've found a silver bullet um but with the work that um so a couple things here in Idaho I've talked directly to some of those incumbents who are the mm -hmm. beef and dairy producers about the future of agriculture and the key is from is twofold. One, excitement around being part of the innovation of the future. They know the system is evolving and they want to have a piece of that. And so we've seen companies like Cargill invest in Aleph Farms, for instance, in both the Series A and Series B. And Cargill is the biggest meat processor in the world. And so they're investing in a piece of the future of protein. Um, I'm not going to overstate it. Certainly their broad majority of their operations are um, still um, in the income and activities, but getting a piece of the upside and working with them and their venture arms to get them invested in and seeing the opportunities from getting a piece of the upside reduces that threat. And I talk about some of these incumbents going through a transition from their mm -hmm. old economy, the new one, and just increasing that over time and having the government incentives to accelerate that it has to show that it's in the pursuit of their bottom line. And some of that mm -hmm. will come from um, their sales to whoever they're selling to saying, I want a better product that reduces great, that's reduced greenhouse gas emissions. And if not, I'm going to someone else. Um, some of that comes from activists, shareholders, um, some of their asset owners. I'm seeing increasingly family offices, foundations, and institutional investors um, calling on those and voting for their shareholder resolutions and using that lever. So, so it is silver buckshot is sort of a term that's used um, from a hunting <laughs> yes. term. Right, not a silver bullet, but multiple tools. Yeah. Um, that being said, Florida state legislature just passed. I'm sorry, it's not so long answer. Um, Florida state legislature just passed was um sorry proposing a new law banning cultivated meat in Florida because some of the ranchers there didn't want that threat to the cattle there. So we have yeah. to show them how they're part of it, how it's in their interest. So it's as I said, it's not smooth at all. Um, but we have to put the pressure across multiple multiple places and create the new economic opportunity as fast as possible. And, and in your experience, that does start to build that momentum, even small actions, those small actions start to, to build momentum, is that right? Yes. And I would see the um, also larger action by, say, a General Mills, a Danone, others who are working with their suppliers and actually helping to fund them to make that regenerative transition. Um, and there's... Um, uh, a couple of different investment funds, sustainable land management, um, replant, others who have been putting together the capital to fund the transition for those farmers. But we need the offtakes from the big ag to say, I will do sign a longer term offtake for your regeneratively grown oats than I would for the non regenerative or maybe a slight price point increase. But a long term offtake can often be enough, even without a price increase, just to give them to know that it's worth investing in that transition to regenerative. So there are a lot of different tools that have to be used. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting because you have worked across a number of different sectors and those we keep coming back to transitions and the discussions that we have. You know, we are in transition in a number of different areas uh, at the moment. There's a lot of disruption com coming and happening, both from a climate change perspective, but also technology and our ability to uh, find alternative ways to feed ourselves. So in, in managing that transition, have you, I mean, I know that you and the laureates have discussions about, you know, together as well. Do you talk about kind of that transition? How do we manage it? How do we get people to move through the change effectively without feeling that, I mean, you've talked about, about the buckshot, but how do we get people through a transition effectively so that they're actually on board rather than just uh, being dragged along or 
doing the roller coaster, which is what I think a lot of people feel like they're on at the moment. So place directly feeling it play in place. And so I think the work yeah. on a local and regional level is so important, not just the talking and the money spending at the national. How does that transfer down? And what's interesting is to look at, I should try to find the slide, but to look at, I have another slide about Georgia, the state of Georgia, um, you know, per, red to purple state, as we say in the U.S. politically, um, and they have received billions of dollars of money from the Inflation Reduction Act for solar manufacturing and solar project installations. Next door, Alabama, I happen to be um, starting a project with Coastal Alabama right now, they have yet to tap into those resources. So showing the benefit of this um, clean energy economy, not just because there's a lot of federal resources there, but also seeing the result of the private investment coming in alongside and the job creation and the, the price reductions, the more choice that they're having in Georgia is aligned with their values of a more independent, um, independent and individual choice. And so I think showing that these shifts deliver whatever's important locally, regionally to culture, like in Idaho, independence, freedom, um, and in other places, it may be other values and other needs. But um, that's where these smaller investments we're making with the local farmers of showing a 12 acre alfalfa farm switch to um, local market veggies and make more money with fewer yeah. inputs, higher wallet or quality, um, et cetera, you know, just showing more money, more predictable marketplace because you're not a commodity seller. There's just that direct farmer to farmer, that direct conversation on a local level, that local bespoke design and implementation of these things. I just think people, unless you see it for yourself, especially with misinformation, it's, it's hard. And how do you uh, build the bridge between the policy and the implementation. So, I mean, you know, taking this from a regulator perspective, you know, how do you create that ability for, for, for it to happen at a local level when you're a policy maker or a policy decision maker? Yeah, um, well, you can do two things. You can regulate and you can spend. And so, um, <laughs> the, um, so in our community, there's a land and water fund that has put money into the Impact Idaho Fund because it sees the benefits of changing agricultural practices and what's being grown to the land and water quality that the fund is focused on supporting. And then they're changing regulations, which used to not allow things like a flour mill, which was helping to localize. There's a barley grower who's growing organic barley, and they were just selling to Anheuser-Busch and Bev, and now they can, they're actually making this really high value, high quality, high relatively high price um, flour, you know, higher priced flour that's um, really prized in locally, regionally, now all over California. And so before you couldn't have a mill on your land because it was farmland. So providing those changes to the permits and the regulations. Yeah. And you've talked a little bit and written about the benefits of developing sector-based benchmarks. Um, you know, can you talk, tell us a little bit more about that, um, that work and how that's what have the results been? Say that again. Sector oh, just in terms of the benefits of developing sector-based benchmarks against which all operators in a given industry can participate. And yeah. just, you know, how that can open up the carbon markets to emerging companies. What, what have you seen in that area? Well, I think um, always science-based targets, of course. And I think... Um, holding firmly to that. And then it allows it for an apple to apple comparison, whether it's for the buyers themselves or for the companies um, to understand what they're producing and um, what the impacts are. So I think just having quality, right, that trusted information in a time of misinformation, it's been a struggle and a battle, but the science-based targets initiative um, and uh, as a as kind of a global go to, I think has has played an important role. Hasn't been perfect by any means, but has played a really important role. Um, and then otherwise, I'm seeing sector players come together and hire scientists mm -hmm. to go in and create their own methodologies and benchmarks, and going through the mm -hmm. third party process of getting them approved and authorized, so that they can lead. For instance, low carbon beef standard is something being considered now. So just a question, Amy, from a New Zealand perspective, I mean, we are pretty focused uh, and the government has signed up to the 2015 net zero targets. We're very dependent on the emissions trading scheme and carbon credits to really, uh, you know, get us there. So what are, what are some of the risks and, and opportunities we should be taking 
in the next uh, decade or so? Well, the emissions trading scheme ideally would generate the capital to then put a thumb on the scale for the priorities area, priority areas of investments and to benefit local, sorry, equity, to address equity. So any inequitable impacts from a result of putting that price on carbon outside of the cap and trade framework, emissions um, trading framework, um, recognizing what we're subsidizing as far as existing legacy activities um, across fossil fuels and agriculture and shifting the capital. So it's not more, it's shifting where it's going. And I know that's hard because you legacy interests, but again, pulling the legacy interests into the, the future of food, pulling them into renewables and opportunities to develop renewables projects. Here in Idaho, just as an example, we have a very recalcitrant utility who did not want to be um, told what to do and was having competition from uh, private developers for wind and solar and changed the rules so that they only have to sign a two-year power purchase agreement, which allows no one to develop any projects in Idaho. And so, but then a private developer came to them one-on-one -on -one and had a conversation and they made a deal where the utility could also get a piece of the upside. And so finding ways, the regulatory solutions um, New York State, California, others have worked hard to prioritize, to incentivize energy efficiency regulatorily mm -hmm. so that utilities were truly incented. So having energy efficiency be the first fuel for um, if you're selling, um, if you're operating in California, if you're selling into California, energy efficiency gets on the grid first, and then they've ordered beyond that. So as far as access to the energy markets, structuring it in a way where you're prioritizing um, what's going to deliver the right benefits. And arguably, if you do energy efficiency first, it should deliver the lower costs, even if you might have a higher cost following that, like a wind and solar. Um, Interesting. Storage. I want to, um, Matthew Jackson, I don't know if you're uh, online, but uh, you've got a really good question there about blended finance, uh, the blended finance model. Do you want to ask that directly or would you like me to, to do it? I don't know if Michael's there. It says, it uh, just, yeah, thank you. Like, Can you hear go? me? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, not off yet. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, you're probably um, in the middle of breakfast. <laughs> a lot of that in, in uh, um, First of all, thank you very much for you know being a part of the fellowship and the laureates. So my question is, I went to market with Haman, another fellow for climate tech, found that New Zealand venture money just wasn't interested. So we went down the route of applying for a waste minimization grant where we're in the last final stages for it. Um, I'm really interested in what you can talk to us about in relation to where you've seen blended finance models work overseas to then use and see technology implemented that then helps create the policy. It's a great question. Um, I just came back from, which is why I'm sick. <laughs> I was traveling, um, too much, uh, too much work and and uh, too much travel. But um, I was at the Natural Capital Summit, and um, I was with a number of both venture investors um, and um, actual entrepreneurs and fund developers. So um, the reality I find is when you're coming out with a first of its kind project. Um, we have to de-risk it. And so in order to de-risk it, we need access to some kind of de-risking tool, whether it is something like a government provided loan guarantee or having the philanthropic um, family offices foundations come together and provide a de-risking tool like a first loss um, fund uh, to de-risk that, to bring in the larger amounts of capital behind it. We, um, there's, um, a number of members of a global network called the, um, Confluence Philanthropy and has a meeting next week in Denver. And a lot of these family offices and foundations are working, for instance, with the apparel sector to how do we get rid of the coal boilers, which are the high heat, hot water for the dying process, um, in, the key countries, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Indonesia, et cetera, um, and shift to electric boilers and renewably generated electricity. Um, 
So there's they're building a first loss fund basically to de-risk um, the financing of those projects, which would finance an electric boiler and finance renewable energy either on site or on the grid. And so they're actually building a new tool to do that. Um, the third thing that's needed in that besides a willing supplier and the de-risking, well, and I should say, and the institutional capital to finance it. The other piece is we need the fashion companies to be willing to sign a longer term purchase agreement for clothing that is done decarbonized. So being able to step up with more of a commitment. So it's really, I'm not going to say it's easy because it feels like so many pieces need to come together. Um, but blended finance has been used over the years successfully through carbon markets. I was a carbon lawyer at the World Bank in 2005 and that emissions trading. So we would sign a long-term agreement to pay for the annual emission reductions from those projects that was contractual. And they would a mezzanine lender would come in and provide upfront money against our contract to pay for those emission reductions. And that was a successful blended finance approach in order to fund the putting in place of the new technology with that money that was lent against our contract to offtake the carbon. So that's a concrete example in place. The other one is one that's in development. Um, and just to note that um, in talking to some of these um, funds working in emerging markets, especially um, having access to grants from philanthropies uh, has been critical to help them do the work to get projects ready for investment to de-risk them up to the next stage. So even just straight philanthropic resources um, has uh, to de-risk, to just get them to a further level uh, to be investment more investment ready. But you still have things like political risk and currency risk. And so sometimes having that additional de-risking, like a first loss um, or a loan guarantee is still really vital. And we need much more money from corporate finance, from um, philanthropy from family offices um, to do that kind of de-risking because it leverages all this institutional money behind it. Once you de-risk those projects, we just there's too little money. Even if a if you have a big endowment, you know, ten percent go into de-risking, and um, and they're rarely, rarely, rarely turned to, if ever. They're just there. It's more of a perception of risk. I've seen mostly than actual concern about either technology or political or currency risk. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Um, I yeah, think, thank you. Sorry, do you have any further comments on that, Michael? Uh, Matthew, um, yeah, it was- oh, Sorry, Matthew, sorry. No, we're on track. I, just, uh, <laughs> I guess my my reflection is, I if I'd asked that question a year ago, it would have saved some time. Uh, we are looking <laughs> at the family offices and, um that's kind of where we've got to we've started that process now so thanks very much for that right. insight and the examples we're talking about them um, um I'll, I'll look into them a bit further because i'm just about to start proposing them to um fonterra and blue scope steel <laughs> yeah absolutely right. where is that corporate i don't know if you saw the study by um I'm going to forget the name of it. I'll try to find it, put it in the chat or send it afterward. But there was a study about corporate dollars and where it's sleeping and it's banks. And the fact that the corporate dollars that are sitting in banks are far greater emissions that they're funding through their investments by those banks than their corporate operations. And so going to a Fonterra, going to others and saying, you know, where is your money sleeping? A, B, how about dropping 10% into here or whatever the number is to do de-risking, to deliver clear environmental benefits from your projects. Thanks so much. Thank you, Matthew. And um, thank you so much, Amy. Just one very quick last question uh, because I am mindful of time and, and people are, will be moving on at nine o'clock our time. Just opportunities or trends that you're seeing in US-based philanthropy support uh, for, you know, and how that could translate to Aotearoa and New Zealand's transition to a low carbon economy. Thanks, Brad, for that question. Um, a couple things. One, I just wanted to endorse David's mention of the Volts podcast and yeah. I absolutely agreed. I mean, yeah. inflation act far more attractive than cap and trade. <laughs> um, and so when you're spending money, everyone's pretty excited. They can get a little piece of it. Um, so a strategy for action, you know, as I said, shift the money from the bad to the good and not, I mean, yes, this was additional funds, but um, it doesn't necessarily have to be depending upon where governments are spending money. Um, 
So trends um, in philanthropy, corporate, I would say corporate philanthropy um, are doing more in this space than historically and um, corporate capital as well um, are doing more in um, driving impact uh, with their philanthropic dollars. It used to be more like, um, I don't know, it felt a little bit sort of, um, I don't know how to say it, but light and a little bit, um, the, the work by corporate philanthropy wasn't particularly strategic about doing systems change work. And I'm seeing that more family offices, foundations, and corporate, um, philanthropy are really looking at how to be strategic. Um, I'm, uh, currently working with the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, and they have historically done a lot of work around development and small business, and now they're bringing a climate lens to that, and what are the risks and opportunities for small business vis-a-vis -vis climate change, and so bringing climate into existing priorities by a company, by a philanthropy, and understanding what its implications are and what that um, how to blend those two. Also, equity, justice, um, justice first investing, um, uh, investing in um, and uplifting and centering indigenous knowledge if we're working on nature-based solutions, um, which of course New Zealand um, already does yeah. that. I think. Thank you. Um, so yeah, yeah, sorry, we're hitting time. No, that's perfect. No, thank you, Amy. And look, thank you for your generosity and, and your time. I know that um, you know, you're know you incredibly busy and it's just, I guess from our perspective, fantastic to have a, an international um, you know, connection to be able to actually understand what's happening overseas, what some of those learnings are. We do have uh, an extraordinary community with our laureates and our fellowship uh, to draw on and um, encourage participants to reach out to uh, EHF and Rosalie and the team uh, to really um, access this community who do have such a rich uh, resource of, of knowledge and skill. Um, Amy, thank you. Um, I hope you're better soon. I'm going to pass over to Rosalie and thank you all of the participants uh, in today's session. Oh, thank you, Anna, for moderating that session and, and Amy, so much insight, wisdom and very practical uh, guidance and recommendations that we can take on board. I think there's a lot to assimilate. So thank you. Um, look, just before we go, we realize that we're just coming up to the hour. Questions, just one very quick question, and we would love you to enter this into chat. What's the one key takeaway or insight that you are taking from this session? Um, just a reminder for you all, um, we're having one of our last of the public sessions that we're holding. Um, that's going to be at midday today, catalyzing communitarian responses to combat world crises. Um, so we'll be providing the link to the fellow only sessions and also to the public sessions um, in chat. And just a reminder that this session will be recorded. So we will encourage you to go back, look at it, and also to share it with, um, uh, with anyone else that you think may be interested. And it would also be good to go back and look at some of the other sessions we've held about uh, helping New Zealand innovators to go global and transformative ventures. So there's been a lot of rich content this week. Um, just before we go, I will do just a closing card of care, just to close off the space. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa ko namo te moana, hei huahi, matato, e te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato, ia tato katoa. Thank you all so much, and thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts in chat just as you come up.